Thank you, Abigail. Um, thank you, everybody uh, who helped coordinate this. Um, I know Bob gave all the individual thanks, so I won't waste time doing it a second time. Thank you all for coming, because I think that I know this is a diverse audience. I know some of you. I don't know many of you. Um, as I was announced, uh, I am a certified arborist. I do a lot of public work on public policy, uh, tree risk assessment. Uh, I'm also a 20-year veteran master gardener, so I have a background in horticulture. My degree is in earth science. I actually studied landscape architecture before I uh, decided that I was much more of a plant person. I did start in art school first, so I have an art science background. Um, and I hope somebody's going to put the slides up. Oh, oh, okay, uh, that's right, I thought, there we go. <laughs> uh, so most times title slides are kind of like just pretty pictures, but in this case, uh, I actually started with a couple of trees up here, and I don't know how this pointer works, but, whoops, it doesn't. Wait a minute. Okay, well, all right. <laughs> uh, I put pictures up here of trees that you may be familiar with, and I'm going to talk about tree selection, but what I want you to understand is that I get calls all the time about selecting a tree that is not going to cause litter, that won't break the sidewalk, that will not get too tall, too big, won't, won't drop stuff, that it's not poisonous, that won't be allergenic. I mean, the list goes on. And I have to tell you, there is no perfect tree. But I believe there is a perfect place for every tree. And so I really don't want anyone here to think that there is a particular species that we should be honing in on or that there are species that we should get rid of because they're bad trees. They all came from somewhere and we're fortunate enough to grow them all here. So there's very few trees that won't grow here and there's only a few that we shouldn't grow here. Uh, but with this, if I can point this thing, I don't know where the... There's my pointer, okay. Um, so that's a, a, a blue atlas uh, cedar. And again, I don't think these pictures are real pretty, but what I did is I put a couple of my favorite trees up here, and I'm gonna tell you why. The blue atlas cedar is a tree that actually will grow and be very tolerant of drought. It is great wildlife habitat. It's prickly. Um, it tends to keep people away from it. It doesn't really need any pruning. So. There goes that carbon footprint, okay? You don't have to hire all those people to come in and start cleaning it up all the time. Uh, there are hazards, you know, pine trees are flammable. Uh, it's not a pine, it's actually a true cedar, but it's a conifer. Don't plant it too close to your house. Uh, the next one is Eucalyptus deglepta. It's the only eucalyptus from Northern Hemisphere. Now, it's not temperate tree, okay? Uh, but it grows here. Now, why do I have it up here? Because I think that bark is glorious. And one of the problems in San Diego, and I came from New York, is that people in this county, by and large, do not love trees. This is what I have found. And I want our public to love trees. And I believe as architects, you want people to love trees too. And I think if we start planting trees with incredible bark, even just a few of them, a little more, that there will be more interest in trees, there will be more interest in people caring for them, and this is a big tree, and it can grow here. So we don't want them lined up up and down the street. You'll hear more about that later. Um, that one you can barely see is a forest pansy. It's a eastern redbud. It is purple leaves. Most of you probably know it. If you don't, it should be replacing the purple leaf plum, which you'll hear about later. Bad tree right now. And that's over here, the floss silk. Uh, for those people who think that trees block views. Uh, great tree, it's like having this gigantic sculpture in your yard. So you have a client who wants a, uh, a very sparse landscape and they don't want any trees. Well, suggest so a sculpture. And it flowers. And guess what? You won't want to prune that one either because it has chlorophyll in the bark. And that was that what 
the result of having chlorophyll in the bark is that animals would come and start eating around the bark because they could get nutrition from it. And guess what? The tree's defense is it grew thorns. So now we have a thorny trunk that keeps animals and people off of it. And again, don't have to prune it much. It's a, it's a pretty well-behaved tree. So slide two. Of course, my favorite, eucalyptus. And if you notice, I have a bunch of D words over here. Oh, gosh, I don't know why this doesn't like to do that. I'm going to have problems with this. OK, uh, arborists talk about four Ds. And that's why I put more Ds up here. So <laughs> our four Ds are about pruning. We're not only supposed to prune trees if they're dead, diseased, decayed, or deformed. OK? So you see, disease has already made it on, up to this list. Uh, it's pretty important to start considering a lot more than pruning, as far as I'm concerned. Pruning should not be in the showcase that we have it right now. Right now, pruning, staking, all this stuff we do to trees, it predominates thinking right now. I think we should be looking at growing trees that need very little maintenance. That's going to help reduce the carbon footprint that you heard Bob talk about. So damage. Um, I think everybody has a version of this kind of slide with trees falling over, pulling the grass with them, and uh, in this case, you know, the fire hydrant here. I suspect the fire hydrant may have been dug after the tree got planted. It's a pretty big, big, big mature tree. may have been there 150 years, maybe before the fire hydrant. So the process of digging all the piping probably undermined some of the, the, the buttress roots for this tree. Then it's so close to the curb here, I suspect that somebody along the line, oh, this is going to be fun. Maybe I need a new pointer. Uh, <laughs> OK, sorry about that. Um, so this kind of process should not happen. And it happens a lot. I see it happen in storms across the East Coast. We don't have it happen as much here, but we do have it happen. And every time I see a large tree fail, my, answer, my question is, what did we do to it? Trees don't just generally fall on their own. If you've ever tried to dig out even a small tree that's healthy, I mean, I, I have a difficult time. And I've planted thousands of trees, and, I'll, and I've removed quite a few of them. And if they're a healthy tree, it's very, very hard to get a tree out. And so when they just fall over like this, it's usually because we've done something wrong. Now, this slide um, actually was not part of my original presentation. I put it here because Brian Kempf was going to be here and talking to you from the Urban Tree Foundation. He's one of my friends and colleagues. And this is a slide from Dr. Ed Gilman. Not a slide, but the, um, the, these two pictures here. Now, if you've never seen them, this is the one slide I want you to think about today more than any other slide that I show you. Because this, to me, is symptomatic of what we're doing wrong with tree selection. And it's not about species. It's about nursery quality. And some people look at this, and they don't actually see a difference between this tree and this tree. Hopefully, most of you, you've been around trees a lot. Hopefully, you do. Maybe someone's pointed this out. Maybe not. If, you, if you're not in the category of somebody who's ever had it, had it pointed out, all the branches are coming from one place here. And here, they're sort of staggered around up and down the trunk, and hopefully radially as well as uh, in one place. So. When you see a tree where all the branches are coming from one central point, and usually about eye height or just a little higher, it's generally the result of the tree being topped in the nursery. And why? Why? Because lots of trees don't branch out when they're young, or nurseries grow them very close together in buckets, and they can't have enough room to grow. So they, they basically tuck all the lower limbs off. The tree gets growing. and Nobody wants to buy a toothpick, unfortunately. They should, because that's the healthiest tree. But if, you, if you're going shopping and you're a resident, or even if you're an architect, there's a lot of people who want instant gratification. So what happens? The nurseries top the trees. They put on a flush of growth, lots of nice branches, lots of green canopy. And then what happens? Looks good, unless you know better. And so the vast majority of our urban trees, and I challenge you to go back to your neighborhoods, walk up and down the street, you will see more trees that look like this than this. And it causes a nightmare of long, uh, uh, 
pruning for the rest of the tree's life if it's not corrected within the th first three or four years. Um, root problems are the other side of it. And while you're kind of looking at that fun picture, I brought, I brought a nursery tree in. And I, I bought this tree at a nursery. It's a ginkgo. Um, and when I actually pointed out to the nurseryman that um, maybe he should give it to me rather than sell it to me, and <laughs> he said, what's wrong with it? And I said, well, first of all, I can't even pull it out of the ground. It's growing through the pot. So he yanked it up, took a knife, cut the bottom of it off, and said, it's perfectly fine. And I could see on the surface of the pot that the roots were really bad. So I questioned him again, and I said, well, you know, I'm buying this for educational purposes. Do you want me to tell where I bought it? He says, it's fine. It's a good tree. So OK. So here we have it. And I don't know if you can see, but the tree is not only round from having been in the pot, it's also square at the top from having been in a liner. So those root type circling, they don't go away. The tree doesn't get planted, and then the roots all spread out. So what happens is that if this tree hadn't been sold to me, someday they would have lifted this out, put it into a 15-gallon container, and it would have had more circling roots. And then later on, it would get picked up and put into a 24-inch box. And then probably after that, into a 36, and you get the picture. So the problem is that by the time municipalities get trees, they've very often been rejected by everyone. And how now a city doesn't see it. They order 400 trees, and they show up in a truck, and they get delivered to a site, and maybe all you're seeing is what's on top. And it's a serious problem. Welcome to look at this. In fact, you can still see, this is the typical liner. It's square, and that's what's on top of the tree. And then after it came out of that, it got put into another container. Uh, oh yeah, roots. Um, I have a problem with people saying that we need a species that won't break sidewalks and driveways. We have technology today that needs to start looking at improving infrastructure, finding ways to adopt our sidewalks and our driveways to behave better around our trees. It's much easier to engineer hardscape than it is to engineer a tree. So. I'm not saying that you know, we don't maybe have some vision on giving enough soil volume to our trees and selecting species that are not so thirsty that they will go anywhere for water. But all trees need water, and they all need soil volume. And all too often, I see this. I mean, this, uh, not this particular picture, but I have seen where, in order to comply with ADA requirements, concrete gets pushed right up to the trunk, just like this, because it's safer. Somehow you won't trip on the root. So now you have something that ends up like this. Um, I don't actually believe it's a species fault. And this is one of my favorite examples. Um, this happens to be two liquid ambers. And if you look at the first one here, OK, this is a, they're actually pretty close to the same size trunk. Um, this one, they're growing about the same distance from a sidewalk, homes. They're both in lawns. They're both on a slight incline. But this one looks like something for Halloween. I mean, <laughs> a seriously bad surface roots, just one of the worst I've ever seen. And this one, you can barely see a surface root at all. Why? They're both liquid ambers. Well, the really scary thing is they're growing next door to each other. OK, so here's that one that's really horrible, and here's that one that's pretty good. Same soil, same moisture, same weather patterns, same slope. You know, So what's the difference? Is it really the liquid amber's fault? I don't believe so. I actually think that cultural practices affect tree roots and tree growth and problems like this as much as the species. And it's something we need to be cognizant of. Because if we get the roots going well when they're young, if they start out like this, they're going to bulge out eventually. And there's no place to go. They're not going to stretch out. They're going to bulge. And as they get bigger, 
I'll show you before I'm done. I have one more sample for you. OK, this, I'm going to skate through this a little bit quick because Bob talked about it a bit. But this is from uh, Dr. McPherson's research. And I know as architects, I hear so much about scale, uh, about consistency. We, we need to keep things in proportion. We want things similar. And, and I understand good design. I really do. Um, but I see a, a progress growing on, mostly in this county, where nobody wants big trees. They see big trees as problems, nuisances. Um, and we're not even growing them to live 300 years. We're, we're happy if a tree seems to live 20 years. People tell me that my tree is getting big and old, I'm saying, how long have you had it? Oh, 15 years. And I think, well, that's not very old. Um, but anyhow, this is Greg McPherson's research and what, what they call the large tree argument. This is a city uh, that was conceived. It's not a real city. But the idea here is that um, the value of a large tree is disproportionately more valuable than the value of a small tree when you count all those things in the carbon footprint, that you can't just plant three small trees and get the same value as a big tree, even though th it would seem to work that way. Um, and here's the sample city, uh, where they planted 1,600 uh, small trees, and here they planted 1,600 large trees, same amount of middle-sized trees, and the net benefit was about $65,000 difference over the lifetime of the tree. So, and that's, a, that's kind of a projected out 40 years. Uh, so this is something that I think, again, we really need to look at how we can get larger trees into our environment. And, um, I would plead with everybody who's responsible for specific, specifying trees to think more about that. Um, if you're not familiar, uh, this is the UFEI, I say UFE, I have no idea what they really call it. Um, the Urban Forest Ecosystems Institute. It was put together uh, through Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And if you're not familiar with Dr. Ritter, uh, Matt Ritter, he's a friend and colleague, and if you don't own his book, I highly suggest you get it. Um, he helped put some of the information and the, the fields together for this website. If you want to know more about specifying trees, this is an excellent place to go. Um, the cool thing about it is you can do queries. And so you, in this case, I did a sample query. I, I spec'd out Sunset Zone 23, which is where I live, which is just a little bit east of the coast. Zone 24 would be here. I said, I want to find trees that are at least 35 or feet or greater in height. Uh, I, want it, I want some trees that will tolerate dry, dry soil and have moderate branch strength and only medium root damage potential. Now, I would recommend if you do this site that you only put in three attributes, but I put in five. and. I still got 86 trees, okay? So it gives you a lot of food for thought, you might say. And there's a lot of parameters you can look for. Now, I want to caution you that some trees in there just don't have a field. So you may ask for a drought-tolerant tree, and there may be one that won't show up in your query. So don't take it as the only way to look. And if you want to know about a tree that you don't know about, you can also look up the name and find lots of characteristics, pictures, images. It helps you ID trees you don't know, or maybe learn more about them. Uh, so I just have a couple of samples. Uh, Tipuana here, down here in the bottom. Uh, fever tree here, and uh, the proverbial, um, I imagine those are, um, um, Canary Island Pines. And I wanted to mention, because I saw that in Bob's uh, presentation, he had a big truck that was pruning these uh, Canary Island Pines. And it's a good example of a tree that really shouldn't be pruned at all. I mean, in maybe an errant dead branch or something that gets broken. But in general, I see these things thinned for no particular reason. And I know they were thinned in my block which is in the city of San Diego. And I was appalled to see it. And somebody spends a lot of money, it hurts the tree, it's bad for the carbon footprint. 
So we need more vigilance, not only just specifying trees, but making sure there's code compliance to, uh, to manage them better. Um, I'd like to address scale a little bit because, again, I think there's this sense that if you have a one-story house, you really probably shouldn't have anything more than a two-story tree. I don't know where that came from, but I've heard it over and over. Scale, scale, proportion, and I understand all that, but I came from a place where trees were enormous, and that was okay. And personally, I understand San Diego, people have view issues, there's lots of things, but there's great opportunities to have big trees. And this is a sample of a tree that's hardly ever used. It's a tiny, it's a small little ranch house. It doesn't have a sidewalk, you can't really see it, but that's the curb. So there's no parkway, no sidewalk. There's virtually nothing else growing on this home. And I mean, this, this adds a huge amount of value to this house. And what kind of a tree is it, any guesses? Most people don't know. Even I didn't know until I got a little closer. It's a black acacia. A lot of people think that's a terrible tree. Weed tree, I hear. And I say, this is my favorite tree almost in all of San Diego. Um, so I think, again, it's re-examining species, looking at where they grow well. And by the way, if you look, you can't hardly tell in this picture, but there's not a lot of root damage. Um, and I think it's something to consider also that the small homes are often in congested neighborhoods that don't have a lot of sidewalks, that don't have, don't have a lot of trees because they're all close together. Does that mean the people who live in those places just are stuck with only little landscaping? And I, I don't think that's good because the big places get the big trees and those are often the wealthier people who have bigger, bigger lots and bigger homes. So we, I think we have to start looking at planting bigger trees in those smaller spaces wherever we can. And you can go back and look at these. These are some of the species that I think that have some um, plants and, and specimens, uh, species like acacia, that was one of them. Um, there's, there's some species we don't plant very much, and this is not an exclusive list by any, by any means, um, but it's, to me it's something to consider that we're not using our palate very well. Um, disease. Drought, I'm gonna let Bill talk about the drought, <laughs> but what happens with drought uh, is insect pests come in and they're opportunists. And this has to do with tree selection because we are facing some of the most serious, serious threats to our environment. Uh, because of climate change, because of drought, because of planetary, I mean, pests are being brought in from every other country. They come in on boats, they come in by ship. People bring stuff in by plane, um, and it's really serious. I don't know if you're familiar with the North American chestnut. I grew up in the streets of New York City, and my father used to take me walking, and we bought little bags of hot roasted chestnuts. And I have to tell you, it was like so wonderful to sit there, and my dad would tell me about these enormous chestnut trees that he remembered seeing. And by the time I got a little older, I was like, where are those trees? You always told me about those great big chestnut trees. And they, both my parents were attorneys and they were environmentalists and they were like, well, they're gone. So I, it kind of really did affect me, but it wasn't until like maybe about 10 years ago that I did some research on them and I learned just how many we lost. And I'm not kidding, four billion trees were lost to the chestnut blight. Four billion in 1904 or over that period of time, that was enough for two for every person on the planet at the time. And if you think that just happened then, it's not the case. We're facing even worse stuff now. Here's some of the pests that are coming, or here, I should say. You may be aware of the gold-spotted oak borer. Depending on who you ask, we've lost somewhere between 20 and 80,000 trees in our, uh, in our out country. It's uh, sickening. It came because somebody brought it in on a piece of firewood from Arizona and it spread radially out from our parks. Uh, and people are still bringing that firewood. It showed up in La Jolla. So, you know, it's, it's innocent in many ways, but it means that we're, we have to be vigilant about having diversity. Um, this is the glassy-winged sharpshooter, another imported pest. 
it spreads a bacteria um, called Xylella fastidiosa. It could attack anywhere from 70 to 90% of the species of trees that grow in our county. Um, that's ornamental, edible, incredible. I mean, it's awful. Uh, it hasn't, it's, it also could wipe out the grape industry, which was the wine industry, so they got on it. Um, and there are some species that we're looking at uh, that we maybe don't want to plant because they're more susceptible. Um, this is the Asian citrus psyllid. You may have heard about it. I hope you've heard about it. If you don't and you own a citrus tree, um, California is the last bastion on the planet that does not drench their trees, their citrus trees, in pesticides because of the greening disease, the, the Asian greening disease. And um, it's coming. Flor it hit Florida, it hit Texas, it's in Mexico, it's on its way here. And it was brought into Los Angeles deliberately by somebody who grafted a piece that they got from somebody else onto their tree in their backyard. So this is how this stuff happens, and we really stand to lose all of our citrus. It's an incurable disease. This is the polyphagous shot hole borer, new pest. Takes out avocados, and again, could take out 70 to 90% of all of our ornamental trees. I mean, it's sickening when you think about it. So when you ask, what's a good tree? All of it, and we need as many species as possible. Uh, Myoporum thrip. That one's not actually as bad because it's not vectoring a disease, it's just causing some problems. So, are we making good choices in genes? Okay. I meant genes, as in genetics. Okay, I wanted to see if you were still paying attention. Um, I know this is a popular tree, Italian cypress. You know, it serves a sort of a vertical purpose. It also has a bacterial canker that's incurable. And they deteriorate, and they look horrible, and you can't really prune it out. So don't plant it. Uh, evergreen pear blooms, gorgeous white blooms in February. Like, don't we love it? But it gets serious fire blight. And so it's a high maintenance tree, and fire blight's also incurable. So again, you know, we really want to think twice about planting trees we know that have problems when we have so many other things that have in our palate we could do. Uh, this is the Myoporum. Um, that's a rather healthy looking one. At the moment, if you have Myoporums, you know they don't look very good. Uh, and this is the, the, the <laughs> venerable purple leaf plum, another bacterial canker. Um, and also terribly topped in the nursery. Very seldom actually look very good. So four trees that are very commonly planted in San Diego, and we really ought to think about not planting these. So diversity kind of goes along with this. Um, monoculture, 19, uh, 1971, Detroit, 1984, Dutch Elm. And a lot of people think all these things happened like years ago. But San Francisco just lost thousands and thousands of elm trees in, in the 90s. So this is an ongoing issue, and we're losing more and more trees. And we're going to be losing more and more trees if we keep planting the same trees and not enough diversity. Um, one of the interesting things about Dutch elm um, is that it traveled underground. And so one of the reasons that it was so bad is that the disease would affect tree A, and the roots touched under the underground, and it spread through the soil, through the mycorrhiza, through the roots touching to the next tree. So some of the only Dutch elms left in the world, or left on a, in, in the country, were actually single solitary specimens, like at the courthouse, where there was only one tree, and it didn't get the disease. Um, very unusual, but some of the ones that we have left, that's where they were. So monoculture is a serious problem. So I don't know if you've heard about the 10, 20, 30 rule, and if you haven't, They've already kind of tossed it out the window, and we're aiming for the 5, 10, 20 rule. And that really says that no matter what kind of a design you're doing, you want to think about no more than 5% of any species, whether it's in one backyard plan, whether it's a street or an entire city master plan. You want to start looking at no more than 5% of one species, 
no more than 10% of a genus, and no more than 20% of a family. And that family part gets interesting because a lot of people don't know how trees are related. Like, who would know that a pomegranate was in the same family as a crepe myrtle? I didn't. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you have to kind of really do your homework if you want to try to adhere to rules like this. So here's an example. This, are, this is the Myrtaceae family. And the ones in bold are the ones we commonly have here in San Diego. So, you know, it's not hard to do. Might be hard to avoid, though, if you had a whole lot of, uh, you know, New Zealand Christmas tree. We got Melaleuca. We got uh, Brisbane box. We got uh, uh, Fejoa. <laughs> peppermint tree, so a lot of trees that we commonly plant are all in this family, and it's a great family of plant. I love the Myrtaceae trees, because they're very, very well adopted, and a lot of them are very Mediterranean. But if we're gonna stay with that rule, you wanna you know, start using these as much as possible, but on the other hand, no more than 20%. Now, when you're doing the designs, um, I, I don't know what you ask clients or what clients ask you, uh, I know as a horticulturalist, people will come to me, what kind of tree should I plant? And sometimes they'll say, well, you know, I like my neighbor's tree. And they'll point across the street where they live. I, I want one of those. And I'll go, well, you know, actually, you probably wouldn't do very well in your yard. And that's like, people don't get microclimates. But what's on, if I have a tree in my yard, it's facing northeast and my neighbor's front yard is facing southwest. That tree, that same tree that's thriving in my location might be burning up in their location. So when we line our streets on both sides with the same species, you're sort of setting up a process where not only are some trees not gonna be as happy as others, um, but you're also looking at all the species being the same, this, this tendency to have disease, and if you plant them all at once, they're all the same age, which is another problem. So we really, this looks pretty on paper, but we wanna make sure that when we're selling our ideas and our designs to policy, to cities, that we're aware and we convey how important this diversity is. And we have to kind of change what we've been doing. Some people think the answer is to go native. And quite frankly, in most of the country, I think it's a good idea. I think in most of the country, the native trees thrive and thrive better than anything else. In San Diego, not so much. And why is that? Well, our urban environment was not here, was not native either. And so when you, when you look at trying to establish a nice ecology here, you know, my sense is the way to improve the ecology here is to sort of say, okay, when are you leaving? Because <laughs> all our streets, all our pavement, all our shopping centers, they're not native either. And we can't recreate chaparral on the sidewalk. And most people who are big advocates for native trees can't even name 10 trees. And if they do, they're liable to be some of these. And unfortunately, um, as much as I like uh, sycamores and cottonwoods, I don't actually think they make such great street trees. And uh, actually, the cottonwood probably is in some ways a better street tree than a, than a sycamore. But um, sycamore is like the number one tree I see because it's native. So let's plant it. Hummingbirds love it, by the way. I'm, all, I'm a big advocate for planting native trees where we can but I don't think they necessarily need to be on streets because something like a sycamore loses its leaves in um, August, September, and we know how hot it can be in October, right? Uh, then the big question is, what is a native tree? Uh, I happen to love desert willow. I have one in my yard. I have a hybrid. It blooms from April to November, nonstop. It doesn't set seed. Now, I love it. But if I was to look at sustainability, Hybrids in general are not necessarily sustainable, because what is a hybrid? Well, if it's not setting seed, there's something going on with the genetics, right? It can't reproduce itself. So there can be problems with these kinds of things. And then you get into a question of, is a tory pine native in El Cajon? Or is a redbud native to Coronado? 
You know, so you really have to look a little closer at what's native. It doesn't mean it won't grow there, but is it necessarily a better tree? I think that a lot of the non-native trees that are Mediterranean, we have a big palette because there's, as you know, on the, on the latitude on the globe, I didn't have a map of it, but if you look, Chile, South Africa, uh, the actual Mediterranean, Australia, and us, that's it. But there's a lot of trees within that, that palette. And, uh, you know, I think we need to re-examine eucalyptus. I've heard, I know a lot of people hate eucalyptus. They think they're fire hazards. They think they fall apart. They fall down. They have bad roots. I've heard it all. And for every bad one, I can show you amazing, healthy ones that don't seem to have those problems. Uh, we brought in the blue gum, the red gum, the sugar gum, some of the, some of the trees that really did not have the, the, the things that we need from an urban tree. But it doesn't mean we should lambaste the whole, the whole uh, family. And so because there are our skyline trees, and we don't have a lot of skyline trees, we need to re-examine some of these big trees. Um, whoops. I don't know why I don't have any text here. <laughs> But anyway, um, these are habitat plants, um, or habitat gardening or habitat planning. Um, I know a lot of you are being asked to design or, or help uh, install uh, landscape designs where habitat, wildlife habitat is encouraged. And um, again, native plants are really good for that. But with native trees, we just don't have enough. And in many cases, um, like using the, the monarch butterfly as an example, monarch butterflies don't migrate to Mexico on the west coast, they migrate to the California coast in the, in the winter. And so what we really need to look at is why is that happening? And I have to tell you, I'm, I'm a native plant person and I am a devoted conservationist. And I'm also a birder. And as a person who loves to go out and watch birds, it's funny to me that I can be out in an open space in a native plant environment, and I will be with my colleagues and friends, and they will point out some nasty non-native plant, particularly a tree, like, like a eucalyptus, terrible. And then they'll see a bird, and they'll say, oh, wow, a cool bird. That bird, we never see that bird. Isn't that cool? It's great. Wow. You know, it's a rare bird. It's a bird that's never been here before. It's coming here. Isn't that great? So it's the same people, but the bird is just trying to find a place to go, to eat, to thrive, to live. And why, is the, why are these rare birds coming here? Well, because maybe where their climate is is no longer suitable. Maybe the food sources are gone. Many, many reasons. But I think we really need to look at habitat in a much bigger way than we have. That it's not just put in a nice native plant garden and it's, it's exclusive. We, we need to provide the things that we know habitat needs uh, but again, let's not be, be too doctrinal about it. Um, I included some links, but you know, quite frankly, I, I think most of you probably know most of these links. Each one of them does have some things that tie to birds. So if you want to attract a particular bird, you want to know about a particular native plant, you might not be familiar with the native nature bites at the Natural History Museum, little videos on all these plants. So kind of cool stuff if you're interested. Uh, and uh, Master Gardeners also has a sustainable, earth-friendly garden plaque that you can get, uh, kind of similar to the National Wildlife Federation one. Uh, palms. I sort of have a love-hate relationship, I suppose, myself with palms, um, because I, I understand now, having had palms in my own yard, and I'm taking some out on Monday, so... Uh, they dominate our landscape. I don't think we should just take them all out, but I don't think we should be planting anymore. Um, they don't have the same ecological and ecosystem benefits that our, our trees do. They don't grow the same way. Um, in this case, they're happiest in washes, and they're not native plants. Uh, we do have one native palm, and it's not native to a street. Um, this is what we have to remember. Um, and then there's this maintenance issue Palms are very, very maintenance intensive. A lot of carbon footprint. And so no matter how you feel about them, um, if you need a tall, narrow tree, there are alternatives. Um, and I got some pictures, you know, 
they, they really are iconic, and I get it. Um, but, you know, they're monocots. They're really more similar to a grass than to a tree. They don't have annual rings. Um, they don't perform those services. And probably bigger than that, um, I was involved in the Fire Safe Council during some of the urban fires we had. And if you, if you haven't seen any of the photographs of like the Scripps Ranch, Rancho Bernardo, when the fires were leaping the freeways, one of the main reasons that, that those fires spread were not eucalyptus, but they were palms. And the palm fronds would ignite, the winds blew out, and they were like flaming arrows flying across the landscape. And so again, I'm not an advocate for taking them all down, uh, but I do think we have to be wary. And just so you don't think I'm being terrible about it, another show and tell. There is some virtue to um, palms. This is a piece of a palm frond, and that's an oriole nest. And I have nesting orioles in my palms, and I'm going to miss them. Um, so, you know, there, there are virtues. They're great habitat. Um, and, uh, you know, so I say, don't take them all out, but if, you're, if you really are planting new landscapes, let's, let's not plant more palms. Oh yeah, this is a fun one. Um, this kind of startled me, if you want the truth, because if, you, um, if you're like me, you get a catalog and you order new seeds, new bulbs, new plants, new trees, every, every year I, I'm a fruit person, so I, I have to get a new fruit tree every year. And I, I pour through the books, and it's so cool. But um, it gave me a lot of thought when I realized that what we're doing right now with propagation seriously affects st uh, sustainability of plants. And one of the key reasons for that is that we are using tissue culture, cuttings, propagating from one tree to another. So in effect, we're making clones. So if we have not only a street lined with the same species, they may be sisters. They may even be twins. And so this, climatically, is a serious problem. And over time, when you start getting these pests and threats and disease, I've actually heard some nativists who think that we should maybe bring new native trees into our environment so that we can increase the gene pool to make them stronger and more resilient. So it's a lot to think about, and I don't have all the answers. Um, but you know, it's, it's something I wanted to bring to your attention. And the laboratory that's talking a lot about it, again, I'm just mentioning it because I kind of follow what they're doing. These are big data crunching places. This Department of Energy, um, they're the ones who kind of talked about what this phenotype plasticity is. And that really, in a nutshell, is the ability of plants to, to adapt to climate change. Uh, so if, you, if you're not familiar, look at this. Um, what they're crunching is pretty amazing, and they are considering the urban environment. Now whether they're considering Southern California or San Diego, probably not so much, but, but it's a good place to be looking. Um, if you're not familiar with the Solar Shade Act, um, I wanted to mention it because there's sort of a misunderstanding that trees can't block solar. And I worked for, this, for the California Center for Sustainable Energy for about five years. And I actually went to my own seminar one day, and somebody was up at the podium, and they said, God, if we could just get rid of all the trees, we'd be all right. And I thought, oh my God, you know, this is terrible. <laughs> and there are unscrupulous people out there who are going to homeowners and telling them to cut down the trees that are shading their homes because they will shade the solar collector. Now I have to tell you, not only is that a terrible carbon footprint issue, but actually they're increasing their need for energy by taking out the trees that are shading their home. So there's other ways and means to develop sustainable energy, and I'm all for it, and I'm not against solar. I used to install solar, so I, I get it, but I don't think we should be taking down our trees. And if you're not aware, the trees have precedence. This act was done in 1978, and if the tree dies, okay, not only does your tree have precedence, if you have a tree and it blocks your neighbor's panel, if your tree was there first, it stays. But if your tree dies and your neighbor has a panel, you're allowed to replant that tree or another tree in its place 
even if it grows bigger and blocks your neighbor's panel again. Okay, so the trees do have precedence. And you can find it in the public resources code there. I just put this little image up because I thought it was cute, but they, they actually use an oak tree and how the branches are set and how the leaves open and close to, to, to do biomimicry to design solar collectors because trees do it so efficiently. Okay, and this is kind of my last little, little plug, um, partly because I know some of you may be involved with community gardens, school gardens, food forests, it's big talk right now. Um, I don't think you'd do it so much for sustainability, although I do think that the idea of the local food movement is valid. And we have more small farms in this county than any other county in the nation. So we should be growing more local food. It does well here. Um, I have a, a pictures here. I don't know if they show up very well, but this is just a bunch of acorns on the ground. And that is a bunch of pecans on the ground. Now, why not grow pecans instead of acorns? And you know, I, I get people question this a lot because you know you'll trip on the on the pie, on the, on the on the nuts. I'm thinking, well, if you're going to trip on them anyway. You might as well trip on something that's worth picking up. Uh, <laughs> I was just in the East Coast. My mother spent hours and hours picking up acorns, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be nice if you could bring them in and eat them? And I know the Kumahai did that here but I don't think too many people are eating acorns right now. And I have a pecan tree, so I know you can do it, and they do grow well here. Um, this is Seattle, supposedly the first food forest in the nation. Um, I haven't seen it, but I do have my kids up there, so I'm going to go see it one of these days. Uh, and again, the idea of it is that to create a public place where people can see what's done and share food and grow food in a communal setting um, it's supposedly been well designed. I don't, I don't really know too much more about it, but you can check it out. There's a YouTube video. Um, I've been in Spain. They grow fruit trees on the street there. And I was blown away. I thought, wow, this is cool. But you know, in Logan Heights, they tried to propose that. And you know, you know what the number one argument about planting fruit trees on the street is? people might actually eat the fruit. Okay, again, all trees, all, all of the fruit, fruiting trees make fruit, just only some make edible fruit. I listed some of the drought tolerant ones. They're not all trees. I got grapes in there, but grapes can get almost the size of a tree if you let it go. Um, we have a tremendous ability in San Diego County, and particularly in East County, to grow many, many numbers of trees. And it, you really need to know, though, if you're going to help, um, I, know, I know corporate places that are looking to, to maybe convert their lawns instead of throwing gravel and cactus at them, maybe plant some apple trees, maybe plant some pecan trees. Um, so there's an opportunity right now to convert a lot of alleys, parks, backyards, front yards, schools, uh, not to mention community gardens. Now, there's things you have to know. Chill hours. We don't have a lot of winter. So there are trees that will not come out of dormancy if it doesn't get cold enough. I have a few. We had a lousy cold. Not, we didn't have much cold last winter. So th that's something you need to know. You need to educate yourself. It has to get between 30 degrees and 45 degrees so many hours over the course of the winter and you literally add them up. So if it gets cold between 30 and 45 in three weeks from now for two nights and I add it up, then I got eight hours of chill. Okay, and then I add another four hours and I keep adding it up and hopefully you get to maybe 100 hours, 200 hours of chill and that's how you know whether you'll see that on the label of a tree. If you don't, it's probably too high chill a tree. Um, frost sensitivity is another feature. You know, with the climate changing, I think that's going to be less and less of an issue, but we may get extremes. We may get extreme cold weather, too, uh, along with our extreme drought and extreme wet. So every degree matters when you're talking about fruit trees. You know, it might, might tolerate freezing. It might go down to 20, 27, but maybe 26 will kill it. So you need to know. Uh, again, disease resistance. Rootstocks, that's another one. I hear people tell me, I got a dwarf tree. How come it's so big? 
if you have an apple tree and its natural tendency is to be 40 feet, and you get dwarfing rootstock that dwarfs at 50%, how big is it going to be? 20 feet, right? If you want a 10-foot tree, you have to get it to dwarf it 75%, right? So there's many, many types of rootstock, and if you don't know and you just say, I got a dwarf, you're in trouble. Lots of good links here. Um, the uh, UC Master Gardener State website is one of the best I know for horticultural information, not just for fruit trees, but for ornamental trees as well. So um, I'm kind of closing up here. Um, I am optimistic in spite of all the, the doom and gloom maybe I gave you today. Um, but I, I do think we have to be vigilant. Uh, I think that if we're creative and we start looking to make our technology work for us instead of against us, you know, we will prosper. Um, but keep in mind, trees have been here way longer than us, and some of our most successful trees were during the dinosaur time, and they're still here. And so it's a shame when I have to bring in a ginkgo that has been damaged by a human, okay? When that ginkgo was here, was growing during the uh, Jurassic period. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to introduce uh, Bill Homiak, who uh, at one time was my instructor many, many years ago. <laughs> so he, he's a faculty member at Southwestern Community College, and I'm going to turn it over to Bill.